Hello again, Muscombe History Group channel calling. And this time we're going to look at the Battle of Marsden Moor, 1644. Almost every history of the English Civil War will record between 30 and 40 set piece battles, formal sieges, and important assaults on fortified defences. To these can be added more than 100 or so fights and skirmishes that had a local effect but are perhaps more readily recorded in the local histories of the villages, towns and perhaps even counties where they were fought. There are perhaps three battles that shaped King Charles's entire war. The Battle of Edge Hill in 1642 which is where the war was destined to be fought to a finish, the Battle of Marsden Moor in 1644, which is where Charles lost control of the north, and the Battle of Naseby, 1645, where Charles lost his army and his finish was in sight. We've already covered the story of Edge Hill in 1642, so we will now take a look at the Battle of Marston Moor, 1644. King Charles I undoubtedly had a strong belief in and commitment to the royal prerogative. His rule as king was not because of a fortunate birth or the whim of Elizabeth I or even the consent of the English peoples. He was king by the divine right of God. He was God's chosen one to rule. Everything he did was guided by God. He was God's will on earth. What he said was the voice of God. All God-fearing people will recognize my will is God's will. When a king tells his subjects, if you go against me, you go against God, it probably won't end well. Such a king will probably make mistakes. Such a king will probably be arrogant beyond belief. Such a king will probably find himself up against the will of the people. This arrogance pushed Parliament into civil war in the beginning and the mistakes that Charles made brought the Scottish subjects into the war against him. The mistakes he made kept the war going when peace could have been achieved and the mistakes will cost Charles his crown and then his head. The map has changed a little since Edge Hill. The King has lost the support of many of his subjects in Lowland Scotland. He had been treating with the Irish Catholics to bring an army over to England and the Scottish Protestants did not like it. Parliament defeated the Irish at Nantwich at the end of 1643. And early in February 1644, a parliamentary Scottish force under the Earl of Leven laid siege to Newcastle upon Tyne. Faced with strong forces threatening Oxford, the King retired to Loyalist Worcester. He then ordered Rupert to recapture the North.
The Earl of Leven and Alexander Leslie realised a march into England is more important than being bogged down in besieging Newcastle. So they went south to besiege York. Prince Rupert again used Shrewsbury as a muster point for Royalist forces, then marched into Lancashire to eject the parliamentary supporters. He took Stockport, Liverpool and Bolton, where his troops committed the massacre of Bolton, and threatened Manchester. He then took Lotham and Preston, and Lancashire came back to Royalist control. So Levin and Leslie came down from Newcastle to besiege York. Rupert marched his army out of Lancashire and across the Pennines into Yorkshire. He did not immediately march on York. Parliamentary forces besieging York were strengthened by the Earl of Manchester's army. Hearing that Rupert was marching to relieve York, the parliamentarians lifted their siege and marched to a chosen battlefield between Long Marsden and Tockwith. Charles then sends Rupert a letter that has puzzled students of history and the English language alike almost since it was first written. If York be lost, I shall esteem my crown little less, unless supported by your sudden march to me and a miraculous conquest in the south before the effects of the northern power can be found here. But if you ought be relieved, and you beat the rebel's army of both kingdoms, which are before it, then, but otherwise not, I may possibly make a shift upon the defensive to spin out time until you come to assist me. Wherefore, I command and conjure you, by the duty and affection that I know you bear me, that all new enterprises are laid aside and you immediately march accordingly to your first intention, with all your force, to the relief of York. But if that either be lost, or have freed themselves from the besiegers, or that for want of powder you cannot undertake that work, that you immediately march with your whole strength directly to Worcester to assist me and my army, without which you will, having relieved York by beating the Scots, all the successes you can afterwards have must infallibly be useless unto me. Rupert immediately swung to the south and entered York to relieve the siege. On being told that the parliamentarians had marched out, Rupert wanted an immediate pursuit, but the York garrison wanted time to recover and celebrate. Newcastle's men had not been paid and wanted their money. The Earl of Newcastle's men got drunk on liquor found in the royalist baggage, and Earl Ethin, Newcastle's commander, was opposed to any pitch battle and was offended by Rupert's high-handed attitude. The battlefield was directly west of York, and Rupert sets out with his army on the understanding that the Earl of Newcastle's army with Lord Ethin, would follow. Both armies had pikemen and musketeers, supported by medium cavalry and dragoons, and each side 
brought between 20 and 30 smaller artillery pieces to the field. Rupert heads an army of around 14,000 when Newcastle's men have joined him, whilst Parliament can muster around 10,000. But Parliament will dictate the terms of the battle. Parliament form up on a low ridge to the south of the battlefield. And when Newcastle arrives, he forms his forces behind a drainage ditch, spread out thinly to conceal their lack of numbers. But then Newcastle's forces join in and consolidate the Royalist line. It was getting late, and Rupert decided that the battle would not start until tomorrow. His units went for an evening meal. But the parliamentarians wanted the battle this evening, so they sound the attack. Rupert's men quickly tried to deploy. battle is joined. It's not long before Goering wins the cavalry battle on the Royalist left wing and drives Fairfax's cavalry off the field. Goering then turns in to roll up the parliamentary infantry, but after a very hard struggle, Cromwell breaks Byron's and Rupert's cavalry on the Royalist right and pushes them off the field. Cromwell is wounded and is taken to a cottage in Tockworth. Leslie crosses the field to challenge Goering. Cromwell sends a small force to pursue Rupert's and Byron's forces and turns his ironsides to attack the white coats in flank. Leslie supports the infantry and forces Goering's cavalry off the field. The whole of the Royalist line collapses and the White Coats fall back into Sykes Close where they can find some protection from the hedgerows. Newcastle's White Coats fall back whilst the Royalist army tries to slip away. Newcastle's white coats are destroyed almost to a man. Only 30 are allowed to surrender. And Newcastle leaves England to a self-imposed exile in Germany. He will never bring a force to battle again. And Charles will lose the revenue that had come from Newcastle's coal, which had bought at least two large shipments of arms from Europe. The battle is over and the parliamentarians have won a decisive victory. Rupert and Newcastle retreated to York, but the white coats that had been crucial in several northern battles were lost. Rupert's pet dog boy was also killed in the battle.
Marsden Moor was the first set-piece battle where Cromwell's Ironsides would contribute to victory because of their discipline after the charge. It would not be the last. Parliamentary army returned to York, which is almost undefended and soon surrendered. Rupert retires to Worcester to discover that Charles had scored a spectacular victory against William Waller in the south, whilst Rupert had lost the north. Following the defeat, the North is lost to Charles, except for a few strong points, such as Newark, the gateway to the North. Parliamentary leaders become frustrated with the lack of commitment by some of their more aristocratic generals. Manchester's famous denial of confidence, the King can lose every battle and he will still be King, but if we lose but once, we will lose everything. And Manchester also refuses to attack Newark or to help Brereton. Parliament reinforces its hold on London and issued the self-denying ordinance, which required all MPs who were officers in the army or navy to resign from one or the other. Cromwell resigns as cavalry officer but is reinstated the next day and begins training the new model army in the area of the Eastern Association. The war would go on into 1645 but the king was losing ground and is left with strong points rather than areas of support. The new model army gets ready to go to war. And that completes the story of the Battle of Marsden Moor. Next comes the Battle of Naseby. Don't forget to press like if you did like it and press subscribe if you want to keep a track of the Muscombe History Group channel. Bye for now.